Well, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to Pulse Exchange. To many of you, I've uh, welcomed back, and to those of you who are here for the first time, so you welcome. My name is Daniel Finkelstein, and I work at the Times, and I'm chairman of Pulse Exchange. <coughs> and these last few days, I've been having the great pleasure of reading uh, a new book, Progressive Capitalism, written by my good friend who's here today, David Sankey. And it is, um, I think, uh, well, it's a product of quite a lot of intensive work more recently. It's really the product of David's thought over a very long period of time, uh, ever since I've known him, because he's always been uh, an important um, critic of the way that the market economy is understood, partly by people who don't practice it, but even uh, theoretically. Uh, and that's very much something that uh, I think Pulse Exchange should be interested in. Um, it should. Um, be interested in how the market economy really functions and what the relationship is between um, the market economy and uh, issues like justice. And um, so when David um, uh, very kindly told me about the book that he was writing and uh, explained some of his ideas, it was obvious that it would be the ideal subject for uh, such an evening, for David to talk about his book, for us to have a chance uh, to ask him questions and uh, to talk about it. I've had the advantage of uh, having the chance to read it, and that means that um, I've got the advantage of being able to recommend to you that you do the same thing. There are copies of the book um, at the back for you to buy if you want at the end of the evening, and also I'm sure David will agree uh, to sign them if you ask him. Um, <clears throat> but uh, before all of that, uh, I'm going to ask David to introduce the topic. Dan, thank you very much for those, for those kind remarks. Um, I think we've now also known, known each other for 30 years, um, both of us in different, different political uh, trajectories over those years. Um, I think if anyone um, today uh, inflicts a new book on uh, economics on the public, uh, they have to have a very good excuse for doing it, because they, there are plenty of, plenty of books on economics. Um, I have two, two excuses. I think the first is that uh, a great deal of number of books have been written about the financial crash, why it took place, uh, what this means for the end of neoliberalism. Uh, but no one, I think, as yet, as far as I know, has said uh, we need to have a new political economy uh, to take us forward to replace uh, neoliberalism, which is now seen to have uh, some major flaws. And the second is that. Um, uh, I've read many, over, my, over the years, many books on political economy. Uh, most of them stop at the point when they've set out the new political economy uh, without in any way saying how you can translate that uh, into particular policies uh, which politicians and policymakers uh, can take up. Uh, and actually, I would claim for my book that the first half sets out a new political economy, the second half says, uh, this is how you can apply this political economy, that is, uh, what is the role of the state in the economy uh, to the economy and the problems we have today and deliver clear policies uh, of economic reform. Let me, let me first of all say how I came to, to write the book. Uh, during, I think, the eight years I was a minister uh, in the DTI, um, I pretty much subscribed uh, to what were the generally accepted neoliberal ideas of, of the period, uh, which were basically uh, markets are self-correcting, uh, self-regulating, uh, and there is no role uh, really for the state. If the state intervenes, uh, usually it will make it worse. Uh, and I also believe that the government uh, was doing a good job. Uh, the economy was growing, uh, and things seemed to be going very well. And it was only really after I left government uh, which was in November 2006, uh, that uh, three events really began to make me question uh, they, those views which were very generally accepted. And those three events were, first of all, when I came out of uh, government 2006 in November, uh, I had to wait uh, three months before I was allowed to see the, the financial advisors uh, who looked after all my investments. Uh, because for the eight years that I was government, uh, clearly they were all in a blind trust, um, and I was so freaked out, and my financial advisors were so freaked out by attacks on the on GM uh, that I didn't see a single person who knew anything about finance uh, for eight years. Uh, and then in in March, uh, April 2006, 
2007, I sat down to look at what had happened to my investments um, uh, over that period. And after they had pointed out that actually the investments had done much better while I was in government, unable to have anything to do or interference in the process, uh, uh, they said, actually, we're, we're extremely worried about what's happening in financial markets. Um, everyone's made this so com com uh, complicated. Uh, with derivatives and other things. They have totally lost control uh, of what's going on. And there is this thing called subprime mortgages, uh, which um, we, we just, it's on the horizon, we don't know, but it could be very serious. Um, so that was the first of it. I, I have to say at that point, I did think, of, you know, do I ring up Alistair or Gordon and say, look, um, things might not be quite as good as you seem to think in government, and then, uh, I thought, no, come on, the, the Treasury must know what is going on. Um, and you may say that's rather naive after eight years of government, but that's what I thought. Um, the second event was there was a private equity bid for the family business. And um, I, I thought that this was um, an, a quite an extraordinary uh, situation, and one that really did show that the uh, market, financial markets uh, were becoming very dysfunctional. And the reason for that was uh, there was not even the pretense uh, that the point of the takeover uh, was to actually improve the, the company uh, that was being taken over. They said, we think it's well managed. Uh, we think uh, we've, we'll keep the management there. Uh, we'll keep the strategy. We'll keep the capital expenditure programs. All we're going to do is sell all the property of the company, stuff it with debt, put it back on the market, I would forget, of course, to tell people that now there's a real danger it will go bankrupt uh, if ever there's a problem uh, on the fall of the value of its assets and we'll walk away with a billion pounds. And that seemed to me to be an absolute classic example, not of wealth creation, but wealth appropriation. Wealth appropriation in this context being defined as uh, doing things in the financial markets uh, which do not create uh, any new wealth, uh, but transfer wealth from one group uh, to another. And that seemed to me to suggest uh, that our financial markets um, were not performing the function they should. And then, of course, there was the financial crash uh, of 2000 itself, uh, 2008 itself. And it seemed to me that as governments frantically uh, sought to save uh, the financial systems of the world, uh, you simply could not go on uh, arguing uh, that markets are self-regulating and self-correcting uh, and that there was no role for the state uh, in this. And that we needed a new political economy uh, to look at these issues uh, and that's what I set out to write and called progressive capitalism. Uh, in setting this out, uh, I think you need to start with a very clear view as to what capitalism actually is. Uh, because you can read many, many books uh, on the origins of capitalism, varieties of capitalism, uh, the history of capitalism, and you won't find a clear definition uh, of, the, of what capitalism, capitalism is. And I think this is very important because it, you need to know what it is uh, that you uh, are uh, buying into, and what, in this case, I uh, support as being the best kind of economic system. <coughs> and there are two I think, uh, ways you can define uh, capitalism. Uh, the first is that the majority of productive assets are held by individuals. Uh, that is fundamental for capitalism, uh, and the reason for saying that, which I totally uh, believe in, is that individuals will look after the assets and make certain they're used productively uh, in ways that the state never will. So the first thing, that the majority of assets are privately owned, and the second is that production is guided and income distributed largely through uh, the operation of, of markets. Uh, and a cornerstone of the political economy of progressive capitalism is a firm, uh, firm belief in capitalism. Uh, I think people will, uh, many people will say, well, this, this book, Progressive Capitalism, is a attack on capitalism. Uh, of course, it's not an attack on capitalism. Uh, because it's in fact very much more a defense of capitalism uh, because it says 
uh, the flaws we've seen uh, in the neoliberal version of capitalism are not inherent in it and can be corrected uh, by a program of economic reform. But progressive capitalism uh, also incorporates three defining beliefs of progressive thinking. And they are, first of all, the crucial role of institutions. The second is the need for the state to be involved uh, in the design and reform uh, of institutions uh, in order to deal with conflicting interest and the provision of public goods and the use of social justice uh, defined as fairness as an important measure uh, of an e a country's uh, economic performance. I think it's uh, one of the great mistakes of neoclassical economics uh, not to see capitalism as a socio-economic system. And it's a big mistake because uh, empirical studies, if you look at uh, the history of growth, you look at when growth takes off in countries, uh, what you find is uh, that institutions uh, have a major impact on performance of firms uh, and therefore on the country's performance. And there are, I think, four institutions which are particularly important uh, in this. Uh, they are the institutions which underpin financial and labor markets, uh, the institutions which underpin the governance of firms, uh, a country's education and training system, uh, and its national system of innovation. That is uh, the network of institutions in the public and private sector uh, whose activities and interventions initiate, import, modify, and diffuse new technologies. For example, if you take uh, the performance of companies, it's very clear that it's very much affected uh, by, by the way they're governed. That's why American companies will behave differently from Japanese companies uh, or Chinese companies. Um, whether it takes a long-term view about investment uh, or focus solely on quarterly uh, profits, uh, whether it's prepared to put resources into training young people, uh, and R&D depends on how it's governed and its relationship uh, with shareholders. And I would argue that in, in spite of Cadbury uh, and the many reports uh, that it's formed, uh, the governance uh, system is not working in this country. And I'll give uh, two examples of that. Uh, the first is what is quite clearly a very serious problem with companies taking a very short-term view uh, of their uh, economic performance and profitability. Uh, the focus is on the next quarterly uh, reports. And um, uh, uh, if that means cutting R&D or uh, not doing the product development, uh, then that's, that's what um, gets lost. Um, and the second is, uh, I think, the, uh, if you look at the rewards uh, which have been gained to chief executives, uh, leave aside the question of whether, what, whether or not they're at the right level, um, I think it's absolutely clear uh, that that um, out of control and not really related uh, to the profit uh, performance of the company. Um, in, the, in the years I was in government, uh, the salaries of chief executives or the board executives of British companies went up by 11%, uh, real 11% real each year, while general wages salaries were going up 1%. You cannot see any correlation between that uh, and the profit performance of those companies. And it's all about uh, what I think is rightly called uh, ownerless capitalism in which the investors actually uh, have very little influence uh, over the boards which have been captured by uh, the executives. Uh, I'll give you another example of um, how important institutions are. Um, one of the biggest problems we have in this country in terms of uh, education and training is the lack of training uh, of technicians. We actually do pretty well uh, if you look at the training of engineers or uh, chemical engineers or any other, other group in society. We do incredibly badly uh, at the training of technicians. Uh, and this is really has a major impact uh, on productivity. Um, and this is not a short-term problem. This problem has gone on for a hundred years. Um, you can find the first reports. Well, you can go back to Prince Albert. Uh, did the first person who said, we don't do technician education as well as Germany. And that is still true today. Uh, and the reason for that 
because we do not have the proper institutions for doing that. Uh, and there are three absolutely fundamental standards institutions. Uh, one is uh, that uh, you have a national standard which works in the marketplace, i.e. if you have that qualification and you go to an employer, uh, he will take you on as opposed to someone who hasn't got it uh, because uh, you've got that qualification and he knows that's a valuable qualification to have. Uh, we don't have a system of funding young people properly while they get uh, these qualifications. Uh, and we don't have the expert teachers and properly equipped places uh, to train them. And on that basis, you should not be supplied, surprised uh, that we're sitting here at the moment uh, in need of 400,000 technicians over the next few years and a large problem of youth unemployment. And that says there's something seriously wrong uh, with our educational training system. Also, just as a side, uh, the system we have for giving careers advice to young people uh, is an absolute scandal. Uh, and uh, that is a, something which each government in turn uh, has made worse. The second defining belief of progressive thinking is that the state has to be involved uh, in forming those institutions. Uh, in the case of corporate governance, uh, or the financial markets, that's because there are very clear uh, conflicting interests. Uh, one of my uh, more, um, uh, really boring <laughs> episodes of my life was taking the 2006 company bill through the House of Lords, uh, which we debated for no less than 72 hours. Um, and the main issue there is not a conflict between uh, employers and employees, uh, there is an issue there, it's the conflict between investors uh, and managers. That was the critical issue, uh, and it's one which only government uh, can actually uh, sort out. Of course, also, if you're talking about um, education and training and the national system of innovation, uh, these are, of course, public goods uh, which have to be provided by government, um, and uh, the, the state has to play a role uh, in those because it's not in the interest uh, of uh, the individuals or necessarily uh, companies uh, to do that, um, that training. I think I, what I want to make clear at this point is that the uh, role of the state I've been describing uh, is very different from what I would call the command and control uh, view of the state, which is uh, what traditional socialism is. It's about directing, about planning, telling companies what to do. But it's equally different from the minimalist role uh, of neoliberalism. It's what I've called an enabling role. Uh, it's creating the conditions uh, which are essential uh, for government, for firms, to grow and innovate. Uh, and if you look around the world, there is now a huge literature which shows how uh, company performance is affected by the institutions uh, of the country uh, where it is. That's not only in terms of how good it is, but actually which industries uh, you will find the company, country is good at relates very closely to, to its institutions. Uh, so progressive capitalism is not about looking back nostalgically either to clause for socialism uh, or ne neoliberalism. I think it's also a very useful way uh, for policymakers and politicians to look at the world uh, for two reasons. Firstly, because it gives a very clear description of the role the state should play in the economy. Uh, I think one of the most extraordinary things that's happened at the moment, which has gone almost without comment, uh, is suddenly that industrial policy or industrial strategy uh, has become a, a, a popular word uh, in fact, we have the Secretary of State for Industry uh, is uh, right behind uh, uh, an industrial strategy. The CBI uh, is absolutely determined that we should have an industrial strategy. And the TUC also wants to see industrial policies. Now, you might not think that's extraordinary, except when I was in the DTRI, if, if you had said, I think the government should have an industrial strategy, you would have been taken out by one of the Secretary of State spat and shot. <laughs> and they would have said, you can't possibly say that sort of thing. It will bring the whole of the Labour government into disrepute. And you would have certainly un uh, uh, unleashed uh, a, a tirade from 
CBI saying this was a return uh, to the failed policies of the 60s and 70s. And yet something we have an industrial strategy. Of course, it's no clearer now than it ever was what an industrial strategy is. Uh, it's just a kind of feel-good thing. Uh, I think it is an important issue, um, and I think that progressive capitalism gives you a way of looking at what you want to do uh, with an industrial strategy, what it means, uh, and also uh, it's a way of avoiding the mistakes of the past. Uh, for example, one of the key issues uh, in the industrial policy uh, is do you just have horizontal policies which apply to all companies, or do you have some which are specific to particular sectors? Um, if, you, if you buy into the idea of institutions being important, then I think it's clear that when you're talking about financial and labor markets, you're talking entirely about horizontal policies which apply to all uh, situations. But if you're talking about support for technology uh, under the national system of innovation, then of course you're going to have, you're going to put your technological resources into those industries where you think it will most uh, have an impact and be valuable. And of course if you're talking about education and training, there are some horizontal policies, but also some which are sectorally uh, specific. Uh, and I think progressive capitalism explains also why government should support industries and technologies, but not companies uh, and products. We do not want to go down uh, the industrial strategy route of France, uh, where they, for example, uh, had those great uh, Jacques Chirac scheme uh, to back a French uh, search engine, Pyro, uh, as a Google killer. Uh, you know, and, and you look at that and you think, uh, you know, that is going back uh, to the 1960s uh, with government supporting particular products which they know nothing really about uh, and should not be uh, trying to support. I think the other thing about progressive capitalism uh, is it does help you to look at one of the issues which occurs every time uh, the economies in difficulties, which is the question of should you borrow institutions uh, for other, uh, from other countries. And um, this is a case where I can, I can claim that I predicted accurately what happened, uh, which is we get to uh, the current state of lack of growth and the first cry goes up, uh, we must be more like the Germans. Uh, this goes up fairly regularly uh, alongside uh, uh, calls in the past for uh, we should be more like the Japanese. Uh, and of course, if you look at uh, the institutional realities in these different countries, there is no way we can become like the Germans or the Japanese, because uh, they have very different uh, kinds uh, of economic systems. So I think what I've been saying can be summed up fairly simply. Uh, progressive capitalism is based on a firm belief in capitalism, and three defining beliefs in progressive thinking, uh, the importance of institutions, uh, how the, the state must be involved in the design and reform of the institution, uh, that social justice defined as fairness uh, is an important measure of economic performance. And uh, we're talking about an enabling state rather than a command and control state or a minimum state. Finally, I think um, uh, progressive capitalism will be dismissed by people uh, on the extreme right or the extreme left uh, who want to hang, hold on to their ideological certainties. Uh, but I think uh, there are a lot of people uh, working in industry, government, professionals, uh, even the financial institutions, who will say this actually is a more realistic way uh, of looking at uh, capitalism and the way forward. And will also want to join in and say, look, uh, we want future governments to reform uh, our dysfunctional institutions so they deliver uh, economic growth, liberty, and social justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed for that. I'm, I'm going to um, abuse my prerogative as been, uh, being the chair to start the questioning um, before I to everyone else. Um, one of the things that struck me, you were saying that you didn't want to make the same mistakes as were made in the 60s and 70s, but one of the striking things in your book is uh, in that very interesting section where you divide the stages of um, capitalism and stages of market economy, uh, 
you're sort of arguing, well not even you are, sort of you are arguing, that uh, that period in the 60s and 70s, though it, was, though it had mistakes, was actually more successful than the period that came after it. So why, why wouldn't you just say, look, the mistakes that were made in the 60s and 70s was simply a statistical, um, a statistical feature of um, making decisions. You're going to have some failures, but actually overall the policy was successful. So I was, I sort of saw a contradiction between that historical analysis, it was quite a successful period, and saying, well, we're not going to go back to it. Um, well, I, I think I fall a little bit short of saying it was a very successful period. I think what I say is, if you stand here now and look at uh, the 30 years of neoliberalism, uh, and you just look at a very high level at what's happened across the world and in developing countries, uh, actually, the rate of growth has actually fallen compared to uh, the year of the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, and that we also have, and that's true both in the developed world and the developing world. Um, so I think it's very difficult to argue that neoliberalism has kind of solved the problems. Um, and of course, it's brought two major new problems, uh, which is a huge amount of financial instability. It's not just the financial crash of 2008. Uh, there's a whole series of financial crashes around the world um, over this uh, period. And of course, it's produced uh, this very large increase uh, in, in inequality, which long term, I think, does affect social mobility and therefore actually uh, economic growth. Um, so I think um, I'm saying it's not a great period. I'm not, not wildly enthusiastic about the 60s and 70s, uh, though I think probably. Um, as far as the industrial policies were concerned, um, they were rather horrific in some cases, but actually what they, you know, the impact was not, not particularly disastrous. Uh, there were many other bigger things going on which were more important. Let's ask a question. Wait, okay. has everyone, everyone just waits for the microphone. And if you can introduce yourself, if not compulsory, but it's nice. <coughs> Douglas Blawston, um, Cambridge Centre for Climate Mitigation Research. Um, you're one of my two chancellors, um, and you're also a very helpful funding centre. But can I ask you in my capacity as Deputy Chairman of the new um, National Health Service Property Company, which was formed on the 1st of April by the government. Um, it's a five billion pound company. Um, it's the third or fourth largest property company in the UK. Uh, and what it basically has to do is make um, fit for purpose the National Health Service properties. That's 160 different authorities, 190 different databases, and 3,500 people um, without a, a, a central job description. And can I ask you this? Um, I personally believe that this fits in with progressive capitalism because it is actually making fit for purpose a huge national asset which is not just to strip out assets, but is also far more to look at stewardship of the nation's real estate and to aid the National Health Service. And the comparables for that, the comparisons for that, mm. are the Grover Estate and Crown Estate. Crown estate. Um, is that positive cap um, progressive capitalism? And how do you change the culture of those people in the National Health Service to meet that new paradigm? Thank you. Um, well, I, I think um, I, I didn't talk about it at all, but, but uh, in the last chapter on the enabling state, uh, there is quite a lot of material about improving the efficiency and effectiveness of government. Uh, because um, uh, one of the things that struck me most during my eight years, I have to say, it took a long time to understand it, um, but I gradually began to understand. Uh, that government uh, was amazingly dysfunctional. Uh, and this wasn't the fault of the civil servants or the ministers. Uh, they both, I think, had to share some blame for not improving it. Uh, it was the fact that for various historical reasons, we have a system which is, which is very dysfunctional. And that's why I set up the Institute for Government. Um, and we've been trying to improve some of those, those issues. Um, uh, just to give you a flavor of that, I mean, one of the things, uh, if you come as a businessman into, into government, 
and as a person described as the head of the civil service, uh, you make what turns out to be a totally false assumption that he's running the system. Um, actually, he's not running the system. Not only is he not running it, he's not even supposed to be running it. Um, because he's kind of like the senior partner in the law firm. He deals with salaries, ethics, uh, the Christmas party. Uh, he does not run it. Uh, the actual permanent secretaries uh, run sort of barren um, supported by their ministers. Um, and like most systems, when no one is running it, it doesn't work very well. So, you know, we, we agonized in the Labour government of why is government not joined up? Well, the answer is, it's no one's job to join it up when things happen. Uh, and I can give you lots of other examples of, of extraordinary dysfunctionality. Uh, and it's not because civil servants or ministers are malign, it's that they do not just understand, none of them pretty much have any experience uh, of working in effective organisations, uh, and there's a long way to go to improve it. All that's a way of saying, um, I think we would do a lot better if we spent a bit more time uh, looking at how we make these institutions efficient, rather than talking about A, their size, or B, whether they should uh, be outsourced or uh, kept within government. Uh, we'd just do better if we spent a bit more time trying to understand how big organisations work. Uh, and what is appropriate to outsource, um, and what you would outsource as a, as a, a company, and what you must absolutely not outsource. Um, and that is an issue which is hardly debated at all in government. Thank you. Um, I'm Tom Levitt, and David, when you were a minister uh, down one end of the corridor, I was a Labour backbencher down the other end of the corridor. Um, I got your book on Monday, but I've only read chapter one, so my question is based on that, <laughs> if I may. And you describe in chapter one three historic phases, essentially the Smith phase, the uh, Keynes phase, and the Freedom phase. Would you agree with me that there are, there are three concurrent trends running through uh, modern capitalism? One is the, uh, the idea that uh, the responsibility, yes, to, to the owners but for profit, but also to the market for providing goods and services, and that's, that's one trend essentially a, a, a free market trend. Secondly, that there is a responsibility and something good about providing jobs and paying taxes, which is the sort of essentially Keynesian one. But the third one, and the one that interests me, is I think probably the emerging new one, and that is that there is something about the corporate citizen's role and the absolute need for triple bottom line sustainability to make sure that what you've got and preserve and value now is still here in 50 years' time. And it's that sustainability and uh, corporate citizenship role which needs to be encouraged and play a larger place in, in a progressive as the general. Um, also, I do agree. I mean, Keynes was not about paying, paying your taxes particularly, and I would have thought um, uh, the one the one thing which most people had in common across the political spectrum uh, is that you should pay your taxes. What what level those taxes should be at, maybe. Different, but I don't. I don't think um, uh, there would be any disagreement uh, between any political party uh, that people should pay their taxes, um, and that um, what's happened in recent years uh, in terms of a whole industry dedicated uh, to getting around the tax system um, is is really very regrettable. Um, it slightly was related to, I have to say. Uh, this enthusiasm for neoliberalism. I mean, I remember the most bizarre moment in government was uh, there was a report by uh, Nesta on innovation in the service industries. And they brought this along and they said, um, we think there's a lot of hidden innovation um, in, um, in the service industries. We're rather good at this. And so I sort of made, I said, you know, how do you know it's there if it's hidden? Um, but give me some examples. Um, and they went away and they came back and they said, we're very good at, in this country at tax avoidance. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're very creative about this. And, and I found myself saying, look, you know, I'm all for innovation. I call myself Minister of Science and Innovation. But we are really concerned with innovation which helps productivity in the economy. Uh, and uh, tax avoidance does not come in that category. So I think it was a kind of mood of madness in that. And 
uh, whatever system of capitalism you have, in a democratic country, you have to say people pay their, their taxes. Um, I, I'm not saying either that sustainability is, is key to this. I mean, I think sustainability um, and environmental issues are very important. And I think if one understands uh, the importance of institutions in this, uh, that makes it very much easier uh, to uh, create the policies uh, which both use markets uh, but actually have an input from government uh, to create a, a sustainable world. So I think a progressive government uh, in that sense is very aligned with a, a proper a policy of sustainability. So I think all the issues you're talking about are very important, but I don't think they really discriminated between uh, the different kinds of capitalism. Thank you. Um, I haven't read your book, so apologies if my question comment seems off the mark. It seems potentially quite centralizing your um, approach. So we need to resell, reform capitalism. We need to acknowledge as a role for the state. But equally, if you look at both of those movements, then they're discredited from a popular mass of society. So if you're going to reforge capitalism, you have to be able to link the principles and the practice of capitalism. So they seem to work for many people. But equally, the role of the state. So how do you combine aggressive capitalism a strong, smart, small potentially role of the state with the need to be able to work this through a popular level with people? So they'll say, you know, this actually works for you and you have an influence on the change and the results come through in a tangible way which actually you, know, you can identify and live with. Well, I, I think one of the, um, again, this was an experience um, in, in government, uh, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, the, the civil servants and indeed ministers um, really only understand two modes of operation. One is you centralize everything, and the other is uh, you throw it over the wall and decentralize it and say it's nothing to do with me. Uh, now, anyone in, who's ever been in, in private industry knows that actually the whole trick of, of decentralization is you, you set a framework in the center and then you can uh, decentralize decisions uh, knowing people will work within a particular framework. So I think what I'm saying about uh, uh, the state creating the right institutions is a way of decentralizing things to companies but know that those companies will work within a particular framework uh, of law. And that's how you get proper decentralization without uh, it uh, becoming sort of anarchy. Uh, so that's where I would see it on that. Um, and I think a lot of this is, is very much about trying to win back uh, the public uh, commitment to, to uh, capitalism. Uh, because uh, I don't think you should be under any illusion uh, that the public is pretty turned off by what it's seen uh, during the last uh, few years uh, as what happened in the run-up to capitalism up to the crash of 2008 uh, and what's happened actually since. Uh, people do not believe that the huge rewards which have been paid in the city or to uh, executives company were fair. Uh, they, they saw I mean, the British public is quite relaxed about people making large sums of money if they see them setting up new businesses, taking risks, creating jobs of wealth. Uh, they're pretty relaxed um, about people making a lot of money. And what they're not relaxed about, and I think is deeply unfair, is people, for example, uh, who run banks, uh, cause them to collapse. Uh, and then suddenly you find they're getting paid bonuses again. Um, very substantial bonuses, having been put in, um, um, uh, you know, having been put uh, in charge of that uh, by a government who's bailed them out. So I think uh, this thing of fairness, uh, we've got to get back if we want people to really believe in, in capitalism. Can I just ask you on this question of, of executive pay? Because it's a question that's bothered me. So I think it is clear there's some there's a sort of bubble. And I always say to bankers, 
we've got the whole housing market wrong, so what makes you think you're pricing your executives correctly? Um, so it, there is a, uh, a bubble, but what I don't know is how to deal with it. Um, it can't, I can't really think of what the sensible government policy ought to be that um, tells the executives whose salary is going up 11 points a year, percent a year when it ought not to, which represents probably a mistaken view of its business, that they ought not to be doing that. And all the efforts to get shareholders to take a more uh, um, sort of forward view, it doesn't seem to have been all that successful. But it, maybe, maybe the truth is shareholders aren't that bothered actually if they hear it, about it. It's such a small proportion of the total companies. So if, if the shareholders aren't that bothered, um, what does one do about it? If anything, I mean, why should I be bothered if they're not? Well, because I think um, uh, if, if you look at it on a slightly broader picture, uh, what, what you've seen uh, is really uh, the breakdown of proper corporate governance. And we, we've tried through the Cadbury report to somehow make companies work uh, with having independent directors and independent chairmen, uh, and that they can work without the investors taking any interest in them. That was, that was the whole point of capital. We don't have to get the investors to take an interest. And that's why we've got endless capitalism. Um, and I think investors are very interested. Um, and also, uh, you need to look at what's happened to our financial markets. When you go back 50 years, uh, we had investors, we had a stockbroker, and you had a company. And the stockbroker knew about the company. Um, and would also, in some sense, often reflect the view of the investor who would be involved. Um, because the way that financial markets have developed, we now have large pension funds, insurance companies, and a lot of uh, small investors. And typically, they then, uh, we've got an enormous amount of intermediation. We've got asset managers on a huge scale uh, in between uh, the investors and the companies. Um, and we have this simply ludicrous position where if you say to an asset manager as a pension fund, we want you to uh, take an interest in the companies you're investing in, they actually say, well, that's an extra charge. We, we don't do that as a whole. Now, if you have that situation, what, we are, what we're concerned is playing our computer models uh, to take little bits out of the financial markets. Uh, but as John Kears pointed out, uh, this makes no contribution uh, to the health of the companies. The only way they can make contribution is by taking an interest in the companies and making, getting rid of bad managers, controlling their um, salaries, uh, and uh, getting them to take a long-term view. Otherwise, it's, it's a zero-sum game. If, if there's very little market money going into the financial markets, uh, there's a little bit of um, uh, raising of money, but then there's a lot of buying back of shares. Uh, so it's totally a zero-sum game. If one investment manager does better, uh, the other does worse. And the only way that this whole vast machinery uh, can contribute to, to um, uh, a good running uh, of an increased value for the investor is by taking an interest in the companies. Um, now, how do you get people to do that? Well, the first thing you do is you point out uh, that there has been a scandalous uh, rip-off uh, of, of investors. Uh, if you look back at the returns of pension funds, uh, between 2000 and 2009, so 10-year period, uh, it was a real return of 1%. That contrasts with the 40 years before that, when it was a real return of 5%. Now you could say, well, you know, um, you know, the, there are sometimes a good 10 years and bad 10 years. But look at that period was the period when there was most money been made uh, in the city by the investment managers, and the investors were getting a miserable return of 1%. And I think we've got to make, find a way, and I'll talk about how we do that in the book, uh, to get investors to say, uh, this is no longer good enough. Uh, we're not going to pay these huge salaries to asset managers and see our pensions reduced very significantly. Uh, and we're going to start taking an interest in both what the investment managers do and make sure that they take an interest in companies. Dr. Philosophy. I thought that, that microphone was the other question. Right. Um, that's it for now, yeah. To you next. Uh, Andrew Mayer. Um, 
One thing that makes me a liberal rather than libertarian is that I agree with you that markets fail and the government needs to do something about that. But I also think that governments fail. And where I'm less clear in your analysis, given that you use terms like neoliberalism and refer to banking crisis, is where you think government regulation failed in respect of banks and what your form of capitalism would have done about it differently. Um, it's quite clear that the number of bailouts that have happened meant effectively that people have lent money to banks and bondholders and were bailed out by governments, by us, the taxpayers. And that makes me furious as a taxpayer. And there seems to be nobody doing, doing anything about that. So would, would that be different from your system? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, um, I've been a member of the Labour government while this happened. But when I asked the question, how did it come about? That was partly because um, we, we bought into the kind of views of the time, which was um, uh, really governments fail, uh, often in regulation. And I remember going around endless meetings, we were talking about a light touch regulation. And that's what we said to the regulators. Um, and it was pretty impressive that do not get involved and, and in any way you know, stop the banks doing all these incredibly innovative and creative things. Um, whereas we should have been saying to them, uh, you're running your banks on 3 to 4% equity. Sometimes that was the most. Uh, now, you know, if you know anything about basic finance, uh, you know, of course, you can reduce your cost of capital uh, by having more debt. But if you're running your bank on 3% on equity and you're trading a lot of your assets, what you're saying is, I can control things to such an extent that my asset base will never fall by more than three to four percent. Because if it does, my bank will go bust. Uh, and um, the regulators and uh, the, the, the government uh, failed to do that. Um, and yet, uh, because they were mesmerized by, you know, this is, this is markets are self-correcting, um, self-regulating. You had Alan Green saying say, you've tried regulation, it doesn't work. Uh, the answer is you, you have to make regulation work. Uh, or you will continue to have banks crash into the ground because uh, the greed of the people at the top makes them operate with this tiny amount of equity uh, when they should be having 20%. But don't you have to let banks fail as well? You're not going to fail afterwards. I mean, let's kind of start that crisis by saying, and then the price payment having not done that, we've got to pay for that properly, which is basically going to be a bad government position. Um, and we've got a massive moral hazard. I mean, half the anger is about the fact that banks will bail out and then continue to take money. But, but the reality is, uh, you cannot in today's world uh, allow banks to fail like that. And go back to Adam Smith, even, I mean, not even Adam Smith, Adam Smith was actually an extremely shrewd person who understood these things. He understood uh, that in financial systems you have to have firewalls uh, because it's contagious. And if you were sitting there when laymen have failed, you, you had two situations. You can fail the out, or we can let it fail and the financial system will collapse. Uh, and that was a real issue. I mean, I don't know about you, but I sat there with financial advisors uh, saying, uh, do we put? Do we take all the money out of Barclays? Because it might it might fail tomorrow. Once you reach that point and you start saying, "Well, oh, I'm going to take the money out and put it under my pillow," uh, you're in real real trouble. And so it wasn't a question of we have a choice of paying the money. You had to. Jeremy Thomas, interested spectator. Perhaps I could take a minute. Um, you've mentioned the policies of the 1960s and 70s, yeah. the inadvisability of copying uh, foreign institutions directly, yeah. and the need for a wider public consent uh, for the continued support and success of the capitalist <coughs> system. Yeah. If I can attempt to draw those th three themes together very briefly, mm -hmm. how far might there be a case, looking back to Samuel Britton and the Treasury of the Tories, and his analysis of Macmillan's um, original National Economic Development Council and the National Economic and National Economics Commission, which were essentially independent and partly voluntary bodies rather than the parastatal ones which they became during the later Wilson years. 
How far would there be a case of the case for setting up an independent form, an independent institution, uh, if you like, an economic institute for government, um, in which uh, government employers, organized labor, and other interested institutions could come together regularly on, let's say, a monthly basis with an independent secretary to discuss the problems facing the economy and to try to find common ground so that we could go forward together, as the Germans, with their admittedly very different system, have done with Mitterstimmung to make Hans Ford uh, largely successful uh, in rebuilding their industrial structure. Um, I'm glad you raised that because it, it makes the case perfectly why you can't copy other countries. Right. Uh, the reason you can't do that, and the reason our various attempts at tripartite bodies fail, uh, is the German system works because they have a very organized uh, trade association system, in which these trade associations are quite large, cover key sectors, and then are brought together under an overarching body. And you have a similar situation on the trade union side. And actually, membership, if you're a membership of the trade association in Germany, uh, the trade association can take decisions on your behalf, and they, they require you to deliver on them. And the same applies on the trade union side. The trade union says, we will agree to wage increases of 3%, and that means you, trade union members, will deliver that uh, and go on with that within your trade trade unions. So you can have a negotiation between the trade association and trade unions. And that applies also to their technical education. Technical education is run by the trade unions uh, and the trade association working together. And that's what enables them uh, to deal with the whole system of coaching. Uh, that's a big problem in our country because if you train the technicians, they will be coached by someone else. Uh, the Germans have it set up so that won't happen. Because if you do that in Germany, you cease to be a good member of your Chamber of Commerce. And in any case, uh, because there are standard wage levels, you can't tempt people away. We, we, there is no way we in this country can copy that system uh, because we have 3,600 disorganized trade associations and an even more dis disorganized trade unions who cannot enforce any decision on their members. And it's an example where whatever else you can do, it's a waste of time trying to copy them. Oh, well, it brought, that, up, it brought up the German street in my cell, which is right. about 25%. Right. <laughs> okay. That's what's going to be with all. Jonathan Sykes, a simple small business entrepreneur. Um, with not so long ago, talking to an ex Conservative Prime Minister, um, my only name drop ever, I think, uh, he explained that his policy was all about progressive capitalism. Indeed, he used that expression. Uh, you probably guess who it is now. Um, and sorry, who was this? <laughs> a, a former Conservative leader, uh, Prime Minister. So this is John. This is John Major. Maybe. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Right. And, and 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 so I believe passionately that we were surrounded by progressive capitalism because that's what inherently I believe in, as I believe many many Brits do. So to understand, in fact, we haven't been operating under progressive capitalism, I find it incredibly, you know, saddening. And if you're going to do one or two things that is possible in the non-too-distant future to make a difference to people out there on the street, what would those two things be? Um. There are actually, in my book, 10, 10 recommendations. I have read the book. I apologize. I'm not going to read No, no, I'm not going to read that as a, it's kind of, it's, it's just, um, I, I sort of think of how I would order those in terms of uh, the most, most important things. In the world, we're not going to get everything we want straight away. No, I mean, I, th I think the major thing I would go for uh, is to improve the contact between investors and companies. And in that way, try and make certain that corporate governance was vastly improved and that uh, people who saved and invested their money began to get a good return on it. Uh, so that would encourage uh, savings. Um, and actually would stop what I see as a very serious drain of the best young people, uh, and people who should be the entrepreneurs, uh, going into the city. I mean, that probably has happened, is already happening, but uh, one, of, one of the real problems of that was it drained off a, young, a lot of the brightest young people who went in, into doing this. 
because they were paid uh, absurd. Uh, not all of them. Hmm? I said not all of them. Well, maybe, they, maybe they, but if, if they weren't getting paid, then yeah. uh, they, they should have re-evaluated their careers very rapidly. Um, but um, so that would be be one thing. Um, I, I think um, I then I think uh, getting the technician um, education right is enormously important uh, for social reasons and economic reasons. Um, you know, we, we're living in a world where we're short of technicians, um, 400,000, and this, this has a real impact on companies wanting to count this country or productivity of countries here, and we have a really high level of youth unemployment. And that is, that is an absurd waste of, of talent. Uh, and if you can see the book, the sort of things one needs to do, which I kind of mentioned. Uh, and then the third, I think, is uh, to, one of our great strengths in this category, and you would expect me to say this, uh, is we are a brilliant country in terms of research um, and innovation in this area. Um, I think we've now got a much improved system of transferring that knowledge from universities uh, into industries, and we've got high tech clusters now beginning in different parts of the country. Um, and so I would put a lot more money uh, and effort into building up those new industries in the future. Ron Dow, the industry from. I'm getting right down to it. Um, don't we have to blame <coughs> the economists who brainwashed a whole generation <coughs> of politicians and businessmen into believing that markets were self-correcting? Um, so isn't the question how we get some genuine new thinking into economics departments? Um, and because, because I think that's very hard. I've, I've actually talked to a number of uh, senior economists, and it's very hard to get any sort of original thinking not um, neoliberal um, ideas uh, discussed and then researched. Uh, so how, how, can, how can we change that so better ideas go yeah. through? Um, yeah, I, th I think that's a very real question. I mean, I think um, uh, there, is a, there is a really extraordinary thing that's happened in the economic profession, um, which I think is, is um, uh, extremely worrying. It, it was that uh, the academic institutions uh, covering economics were captured by a particular school. Uh, this was the neoliberal or neoclassical school, uh, which became highly mathematically oriented. Um, and they produced these models, which were based on absurd assumptions. Um, and then they used these to show that uh, markets were self-correcting, and there was no room for the state because everything would correct. Uh, they failed to point out um, that uh, the assumptions which were always were based were completely unreal, and that as they were producing these things, uh, every so often the economy would fall apart. So, you know, the financial crash of 2008 wasn't the first one. Uh, before that, uh, you would have, of course, long-term capital management uh, run by two Nobel Prize winning economists, which nearly managed to bring down the whole financial system in America. Um, and uh, this school captured uh, the economic profession. So if you were a young economist and you actually thought differently uh, uh, and said, I don't want to do this mathematical economics, I want to do something which is more realistic, you just simply didn't get a job. You didn't pay, you didn't um, actually. You, you couldn't do it because if you weren't published in those highly mathematical journals, uh, you wouldn't get a job. Um, I think that's a very unhealthy, it was a very unhealthy development. And I, I agree with you. I think it's become a very unscientific subject. Um, and uh, we need some more new economic uh, thinking. And there is, a, there is actually an organization which George Soros has set up called the Institute of New Economic Thinking, uh, which is beginning to try and uh, get some new thinking on these issues. Thank you for a very compelling vision, and I was particularly energized by the prism that you've used to arrive at that vision, vision looking at institutions. Um, my uh, background is um, investing in innovation, 
Um, I've invested in about 120 early stage companies. Um, I'm John Taston, I've been at Harvard for the last couple of years, focused on privacy. And I've been focusing on privacy because it seems to me that it's a good which exhibits a property that Michael Sandel has written about, and you may have touched on in your own book, I don't know, um, the moral limits of markets, where markets perhaps have a moral uh, difficulty in pricing goods. Um, privacy, it seems to me, is one such good. It underlies a lot of what you referred to in the last uh, answer you gave, um, of the building of new innovative companies of the future. Uh, do you think that um, privacy is an area where perhaps we're missing an institution? Um, and since entrepreneurs, by their nature, tend to do their entrepreneurship within and amongst existing institutions and rarely bend their minds to um, how to create a new institution, how could that new institution come into being? So this is about privacy, is it? You know, what, what yes, perhaps I could be more could, clear could on that. Could you explain a bit more about that? Uh, yes, many of the new um, businesses which are being developed rely to some extent on the connected economy, which is where I spent my uh, yeah. uh, focus on innovation. Um, and because the connected economy does exactly what it says on the tin, um, privacy often gets to some extent sidelined. We've seen that with, for example, Bloomberg um, very recently, um, and with uh, Facebook just recently um, uh, able to control cameras and uh, audio uh, on, on uh, devices. No one's doing these with sort of a man intent, I don't think. It's just that there's no institution acting on behalf of the individual uh, to counterbalance the um, innovation in the private sector. You know, uh, people in the developed world expect that over 100 years, companies on the whole, with some notable exceptions, uh, rarely get past their seventh birthday. So to put private data into, uh, uh, individual data into private companies seems to be a, a, an institutional mismatch, a governance mismatch. And there again, you wouldn't want the data to necessarily be held by government either. So something that's non-government and non-private sector, it would seem, uh, is an institution that we're, that we're missing. I, I, I think it's. Um, I think that's a very interesting issue. I think um, I actually talk a little bit about it in the book in terms of um, the whole issue of new technologies coming along. Um, this is slightly a nerdy kind of point, but, but um, if you look back over the history, uh, you'll find that every so often there is a period where a whole new kind of space uh, is opened up where previously markets haven't worked. Um, if you go back to uh, the 16th, 17th century, uh, there suddenly there came a point uh, when people were actually sending ships across the seas um, because, because of the technology enabled you to do that. And of course everyone at the time said, there is no possible way uh, we can control things on the high seas. And there was real confusion as to whether you had pirates or, or proper trading. Um, but people said it's impossible. Uh, as, as trade grew, uh, people said, no, hang on, um, we can't have this situation where this is an unlawful area. And so people started uh, imposing laws on seas and traffic. And you'll find the same thing happened when radio comes for the first time. People say, uh, we've got radio. Uh, we can't possibly, conceivably, control this. Um, uh, and then, of course, uh, you start getting uh, terrible confusion because uh, the wave bands uh, cross, and of course the famous example of the Titanic, where there was a delay because the messages got mixed up and so on. And people said, no, no, we now have to control this. And the internet is a, is, is a totally uh, comparable case of that, where the original uh, people, of course, who set up uh, the internet and the connected world said this is a wholly new world. There's no way that it can be controlled. In fact, it's immoral to control this free. Uh, but of course, as, as you begin to do commerce on the internet, of course, you create markets and then you have to have rules. So, you know, if you get, you buy on the internet fraudulent goods from Germany, you have to have a legal process. Uh, which enables this to be dealt with. All that's a way of saying, uh, don't buy into the myth uh, that the inter that internet is somehow a totally new world where institutions of law cannot apply uh, because they will have to, and people will face, find a way around this. Um, and uh, one of those things will probably be privacy. I and mean, then you can see it happening. You know, uh, people say, well, hang on. 
Uh, we really do not want uh, pornography uh, coming to our children on, on the internet for some fish sub controls. Uh, I remember I came across it with the animal rights extremists. Uh, again, you know, are you happy to have um, things coming up on the internet you know, in Holland uh, saying, please attack this particular research institution or company because it's doing experiments on animals? And the answer is no. You know, that, this has to be subject to the same kind of rules of regulation as other economic activities. We'll work the back. Hello, uh, good evening. John Argar from Right Blue. Um, Lord Sainsbury, it strikes me that a recurring theme in your analysis has been the lack of incentive for active institutional investor ownership of public limited companies, or this disconnect between the outside investor and the firm's strategy and what's right for employers. So I suppose that surfaces the question of what role, if any, mutual and cooperative ownership models might play in your idea of progressive capitalism. Um, the answer is I, th I think there is a role, but um, I don't think it's ever going to be the central role. Um, uh, when you're looking at the big corporations of today, I don't think you can uh, run them on a cooperative model. That's not to say I don't think uh, there's room for cooperative models or social uh, social organisations. Um, I don't think it tackles though, the big issue of you know how do you keep, keep control uh, of big companies, um, whether it's BP or Marks and Spencers or other companies. Okay, I've just got a, just a couple of these questions. One there. Did you want to, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's not That's right. Okay, fine. Okay, so one, one just here, yeah, and then one. There. It's Jonathan Stern. I just wanted to follow up on that question, actually. Um, well, now we have markets who are providing essential goods and services, yet every time we look at them, we find the interest is in providing services to Middle England. We still actually have the poverty premium, we have people on low incomes and vulnerable positions paying more for essential goods and services. I'm just wondering what progressive capitalism, therefore, what the solution is. Are we to we cross our fingers and hope that the company is actually going to see the benefits of inclusive services and social justice? Or do we want regulators to be intervene more? Or, in relation to the last question, do we just hope that civil society will come up with a solution? Um, well, I think one of the most uh, interesting issues here is this whole question of how do you work, when do markets work? One of the things they don't work is there is not proper information. Uh, that's been one of the problems on the whole relationship between investors uh, and asset managers. For example, it's very difficult, uh, you will find, if you're an investor or a pension fund, to find out exactly what you are being charged uh, by the asset managers. And the asset managers are very, very keen to keep those, that information confidential. And I think this is a role where the state does need to say, uh, if you're an asset manager, you will uh, on, produce a proper information about what you are charging companies, and you won't mix it up with the investment returns, uh, so that um, in, 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 investors can know what they're being charged, and therefore, if they're not happy with that, go to another uh, asset manager. So I think information uh, is enormously important. Uh, in markets, um, and uh, that at least is the first step to trying to deal with with some of those problems. Uh, because, um, I mean, just to give you an example of um, a sort of um, interesting fact, uh, if you if you charge two percent as an asset manager rather than one percent charge for running people's assets over the twenty five years uh, of a typical pension fund. Uh, that will reduce the final pension by 20%. Now, this, this, this is very substantial figures of money. Uh, and that's how uh, it's, the asset managers have been able to pay a million pound salaries to, to their employees. Um, I think the first step is to get everyone to understand uh, what is happening by good information. And, and that applies also to pension funds. Uh, who should report what uh, charges they're, they're receiving from the asset managers 
and what returns they're getting. And I think when people begin to know uh, A, what the uh, charges are, and B, what miserable returns they're getting, uh, then they're going to start saying uh, it's no longer acceptable to have asset managers uh, taking uh, what was 40%. At the height of 2008, uh, the financial worlds were taking, were providing, were not providing, were taking 40% of all corporate profits uh, in this country. That, that can't be right. Okay, and there's one last question. Thank you. Uh, I was trying to get in with the question that was asked behind, so this is a follow-up question. I'm sorry I haven't read the book. Um, your answer to the question about mutuals and cooperatives said, well, we're beholden to large organisations, and that seems a, almost a capitulation to the tendency to monopoly or very large organisations. Do you, uh, do you think that the state has any role to address the issues you, you, uh, you addressed about owners capitalism in supporting mutuals and cooperatives? I, mean, I found your answer quite short on that. Um, well, I, I think they can create the right conditions. Uh, I think also they can uh, uh, stop. Well, let's not stop because it's too late. But I mean, I don't think it ought to be under any illusion. Uh, we used to have lots of mutuals. Uh, they were called building societies in the end. And um, under this great wave of neoliberal thinking, uh, these were pretty much broken up quite deliberately, and the money returned to uh, individual uh, owners of this. Uh, and they were destroyed. Um, and that was part of the neoliberal thinking, uh, that you shouldn't have uh, these kind of bodies. Um, now, whether you, how you can recreate that, um, I'm not, not certain, but certainly the government should be trying to, to encourage that, because I think they do play a big role. Um, and there are these things which are probably best done by more trust-like um, organisations, uh, rather than organisations which uh, are providing a service for payment for people. I mean, I'd rather thought all those mutual societies were a rather good thing, uh, but they were destroyed quite, quite deliberately as part of the neoliberal thinking. Okay. David, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we really enjoy it.